to go over the last two macro theorists, the conflict theorists, which we haven't covered yet, Karl Marx and Max Weber. We've already gone over functionalism. This is conflict theory. When we meet face to face again, I'll go over the micro theory, the micro theoretical paradigm, which is symbolic interactionism. So what do you know about Marx? Karl Marx, what have you heard? The first thing that usually comes to students' minds is communism. And that's understandable because the Communist Manifesto was written for a popular audience. And if you Google Karl Marx, somewhere early in the results, father of communism will come up, but that is debated. Because most of his work within the intellectual community, for those who study Marx, his main work was Das Kapital. If you look at the physical pages that he actually wrote on communism, guess how many there were? How many pages do you think that he wrote on communism? It was less than 100. It was about 48, 50 pages. He basically wrote a pamphlet called the Communist Manifesto. He was asked to write it. He was paid to write it. And so it was the Communist League commissioned him to write a vision of what this might look like, what are some of the... Uh, arguments against communism and, and how does he tackle those. And so that was a sort of a break from his life's obsession, which was understanding and analyzing capitalism. He wrote over a thousand pages in a multi-volume work on capitalism. That work is called Das Kapital. Or capital. You should probably remember that. That is his main work. He also wrote economic and philosophic manuscripts and German ideology. All of these works, again, just obsessed with capitalism and trying to understand it. So over a thousand pages, multi-volume volumes one through four on capitalism. That is what he spent his life writing about. And a lot of Marx's writings we didn't get until after he died. A lot of his work was unfinished, unfinished manuscripts. So let's look at what Marx actually said. Um, so he's talking about how society is tending towards a split society with the haves and the have-nots. He argued that there is this middle class, there are other classes, but as time goes on, the middle class is going to fall into the working class. You'll have the upper class who will start questioning whether or not capitalism is the best system. They also will have problems, begin to question the morality of capitalism. But we're tending towards this. So we're divided, we'll become a divided society of haves and have-nots. Proletariat, which is the working class, and the bourgeoisie, the upper class. So the haves and the have-nots. If you're the upper class, you own the means of production. And those who own the means of production also control the ideas. They control all of the things, all the technology that puts out the ideas. And this helps to promote a false consciousness among the working class. For Marx, in order for the working class to get out of their situations, to have a better lives, they have to realize a class consciousness or class solidarity. That term you should be able to recognize as a term that a conflict theorist would use, a term that Karl Marx used, class consciousness or class solidarity. As it stood, the working class didn't think that they were the working class. They thought that they, if they worked hard enough, they could eventually become the upper class. And so they're operating under this false consciousness. They need to get over that, realize class solidarity, and once they did, they would revolt and overthrow the system of capitalism and something else would take its place. Within a system of extreme capitalism, the worker continues to be alienated from his or her work. So Marx says here, the devaluation of the world of men is in direct proportion to the increasing value of the world of things. So what does he mean by this? He recognizes that creating more and more material things in many ways makes people's lives better, but in many ways it causes more problems. The worker is producing more and more things, being more productive, but their wages are not keeping up with their productivity. 
the middle class may be go may go into debt trying to own all these things so it may be just an illusion of things getting better of people benefiting from all of these this ex excess of material things so is it just an illusion and the direct quote is actually the worker becomes all the poorer the more wealth he produces the more his production increases in power and size. The worker becomes an ever cheaper commodity, the more commodities he creates. The devaluation of the world of men is in direct proportion to the increasing value of the world of things. Labor produces not only commodities, it produces itself in the worker as a commodity. Marx was concerned with workers becoming alienated from the things that they are producing, becoming alienated from their work. Capitalism contains the seeds of its own destruction. That's a quote that you should remember, a statement that you should be able to associate with conflict theorists and with Marxists. By this, Marx meant capitalism will eventually fail because it's full of contradictions. And there are four contradictions that you should remember. The first is that there are more proletariat than there are bourgeoisie. The very nature of class stratification is that there's always a small percentage of people at the top and a larger number of people at the bottom. And again, Marx felt that those who are middle class will eventually fall into the working class. The working class body is going to get larger and larger. So this is a contradiction within capitalism, a seed of destruction, that there will be a growing body of working class people. They will outnumber the bourgeoisie. Number two. Capitalism cannot sustain itself without workers to pay into the system. So if the goal of the capitalist is to make greater and greater profits, then one way in order to do that, you have to exploit the worker more and more. You have to pay them lower wages. So we're going to end up with a situation where workers can't even buy the products that they're making. So who's going to pay into the system? It can't sustain itself without workers to pay into it. That's contradiction too. Contradiction three, when you read Marx, you catch, if you read his actual words, right, not interpretations of what he said. In fact, there's actually a rumor where Marx said, I am not a Marxist. And he's read what people said was Marxism. He looked at what certain leaders and dictators said, said was Marxism and said, I am not a Marxist, if that's what Marxism is supposed to be. And that's just a rumor. There's no hard evidence that he actually said that, but that's just in looking at what he actually said and how he's been interpreted. So with, with regard to, to point three, if you read his work, he actually had a lot of admiration for capitalism. He recognized that it capitalism had the potential to create all kinds of new technologies, all kinds of innovations, but it was, it was the producing of all these things that were eventually going to lead to its downfall. Because what would happen is that capitalism is going to create a surplus and that is going to aid the revolution and what happens after the revolution. And in particular, it's going to create all these innovative ways for workers to communicate with each other. Right? In his day, we didn't have social media, email, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram or all these, the internet, all these different ways for workers to get information and for workers to communicate with each other. And that he thought would help them to overcome false consciousness, allow them to collaborate and work together much more easily. So capitalism is going to produce all the technologies that will aid worker communication that will help to lead to its to its downfall, to its destruction. And it's going to create this surplus that will aid the revolution and what happens after it. And there's a very important point um, along with that as well, and that is that Marx was a historical materialist. So if you read Marx and the way he defined the historical stages of society and how any other system other than capitalism develops, what develops after it, he wasn't sure. Communism, socialism, he hadn't worked that out yet. But nothing could be successful. So, for example, communism could not be successful until capitalism spreads worldwide. Before any system takes over, we have to have that surplus. We have to have all of that produced. We have to go through that stage. As a historical materialist, he's looking at how societies go from one stage to the next. So capitalism has to spread around the world before any other system can take its place. You cannot go from feudalism to communism. It won't work. It will fail.
you have to go through these stages first. So that's another sort of misunderstanding of Marxist communism and how other folks defined it. Okay, so we've gone through the first three, right? The fourth one is the environment will not be able to sustain capitalism. We're going to grow and grow and grow. There'll be all this growth, but there's only so much space in which to grow. The environment will not be able to sustain it. We'll harm the environment. So one, the working class outnumbers the bourgeoisie, the upper class. That's one contradiction. Two, capitalism cannot sustain itself without workers to pay into this system. Three, capitalism is going to produce all of the material things, the technologies that will aid worker revolution. And four, the environment will not be able to sustain capitalism. Those you should remember. These are the contradictions that Marx laid out within capitalism. Now, I put up a, an RSA animate of David Harvey. David Harvey has been reading uh, Marx for decades and studying Marx for decades. He's formerly of the London School of Economics, and he did... Uh, did worked with us a little bit at uh, the CUNY Graduate Center. His lectures are online, but the RSA Animate that I put up speaks to how capitalism solves its crises. So he looks at how it these contradictions have never brought capitalism down because it solves its crises by shifting the problem around globally. So you can take a look at that. It's not required. It's there for, you know, if you're interested in, in this. I've also put up some pieces um, from Richard Wolff. Okay, so now Weber. Let's look at Weber. Weber um, is said to have been arguing with the ghost of Marx. Use Max Weber. The name is cut off a little bit there. So there, I fixed it. Okay, so Weber, he's dealing with what Marx left behind. And some of Marx's works were not published completely. So he's working with what he has from Marx. So this is why he's said to always be arguing with the ghost of Marx. Marx has passed away by the time Weber starts working on these ideas. But his main contribution that we need to know for this class is how he looks at the other dimensions of social class. So if class is just about money, how much money you make, Status is about how you spend that money. So there are different dimensions. For Marx, we're looking mostly at the haves and the have-nots, the upper class and the working class. For Weber, he says it's not just class. There are other dimensions. Class is how much money you make. Status is knowing how to spend that money. In other words, pedigree, grooming, prestige, status. And then there's party or power. So you can have class but not have status. An example that Max Weber talked about was the nouveau riche, new money. You saw at the beginning of the semester the clips from Born Rich, one of the um, young, young men talking about the difference between old money and new money. So people can make a lot of money, but not necessarily be accepted into old money circles. So status, having prestige. You can make a lot of money with what you do. You might not be very prestigious. You can have class and status. You make a lot of money. People value what you do. There's some prestige attached to your occupation, but you don't have a lot of power, political influence, or creative decision-making power. At the end of the day, you're not the one who makes the final decisions, although you have some status and you have some money. So the differences between these and the intersections. You'll want to remember that this was something that concerned Max Weber. Now I have for you um, an example. And hopefully this will play for us. This is from People Like Us. You can look in YouTube. We're using these as examples of what Max Weber was talking about. So in this first clip, all you need is cash. You'll hear something about the difference between old money and new money, the difference between class and status. Hampton and East Hampton, they each have strong personalities in their own days. I don't 
And do they know the hamster? Yes, nobody else does. <laughs> but it has the name in it, and there no, are but people. It's still, I know what people mean. They do mean West, the, the resort town. Hampton Bay is this place where electricians live. I don't mean to say anything about it. No, excuse me, I... No matter where you've risen in life, fitting into your new surroundings may not be a done deal. Even if you've struck it rich, moved to the fancy part of town, and built your dream house, you still may not be ready to swim with the big fish. Here's the last new house that somebody is. That's absolutely nouveau. Yep. Somebody has knocked down some house and decided to. But they're trying. <laughs> I think originally this was a very waspy community. And as things began to change, other groups started coming in. So now there is an equal number of prominent Jewish people. I'm sure there are some blacks out here. Um, you know, becoming slightly diverse, but I wouldn't exactly yeah, call diverse. this a multicultural area. Right. That's fair. <laughs> In the Great Gatsby, F. Scott Fitzgerald told the story of a gangster who threw lavish parties in order to be accepted by New York society. Eighty years later, the game of social advancement is still being fought on the green lawns of New York's summer colony as new money stakes its claim to social position. It's a mix. I don't Fashion know. age. You know, I don't think everybody hears a rock and roll. So far, I've seen Francesca Scandula, famous photographer that everybody knows, and also David Hasselhoff from Baywatch. Well, I would say that um, I have uh, been able to and have access to uh, the best of all things, quite frankly. And um, people from around here certainly, I think, are in the same kind of a level in a group. So it's, it's kind of nice in, in a good way. It's something you work for and you retain. So it's a, it's a nice feeling. There's this thing on Wall Street called the wealth effect. You immediately get spoiled, you immediately adopt a sense of entitlement. There's this feeling of, I'm very rich, I'm out here in my $4 million home, I want instant attention, I want you to pet me and caress me and be terrific to me, even though you're a 19-year-old kid working his way through college at the bagel store. So if you want to see class, go to the bagel store in the morning when the guys pull up in their Porsches and push around the poor kid behind the counter. The, the rich rule. The rich rule. We have had such a concentration of wealth in America over the last 10 years. It's phenomenal. It's phenomenal. It's, ama it's amazing. Anybody else has any money? Anybody here got any money? It's amazing. Any of us have any other money except for that small group that's way up at the top, extremely exclusive, making not millions, but billions now. Okay, I wanted to play this one last clip related to people's subjective understanding of class and the mixture of class and status, according to Weber, a contemporary example. This one's called Trouble in Paradise, and this couple is from Staten Island. I actually used to live in Staten Island, and anybody in class who lives there is probably familiar with Tote Hill. This is a separate area from the rest of Staten Island where wealthy people live, and so for this example, this couple, the young woman is from Tote Hill, and the man in the video is not, and they're getting married. So you hear there um, some of the tension there in terms of class and status for the young man and woman. <laughs> you know, the fit. fountains, the, the statues, fountains, the, the pools, the statues. Here, the, the stainless steel guardrails on, 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 on a million-dollar home. You know what I mean? The Marys on a half shell. And the Marys on a half shell. Very good, sweetie. Oh, do we do we mention that she's Protestant and I'm Jewish? <laughs> so we could say that. So well, not that we could say. It. That's another classy thing. <laughs> Absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely not. This is Toad Hill. This is uh, Creme de la Creme of, of Staten Island. And uh, most people who know Staten Island certainly know that. It's the, it's the known upscale area, um, high class neighborhood, I guess we can call it. There are a lot of doctors, physicians, uh, lawyers that, that live in, and um, reside and keep their families up here. 
Northwest Long Lane, this cool toad hill, it's known as Snob Hill. <laughs> Some right. people sometimes run around with their noses way too far up in the air. Like myself. Like yourself sometimes, yes. Okay, are we, are we lost well? here? Do we need to get out of here? Well, we put the engagement ring on the newspaper last year. I asked him if he can change his town. Yes, that, that was, I guess, considered a big thing for him. And I said, you know, he's on the border of Grant City and Dongan Hills. There's three areas right there you can consider his neighborhood, Midland Beach, Grant City, and Dongan Hills. And I said, would you mind if we said Dongan Hills? And he said, no, not at all. Right? Laura, what class do you think you got? That's a better question. <laughs> um, I would consider Scott the middle class. Perhaps towards the lower end, but not, I shouldn't say, I'm not, not saying lower class. <laughs> um, it depends on, on certain aspects of his life. I think um, I wouldn't consider police officers classy people. I really don't. I haven't seen low class because I haven't been, been okay, raised in that surrounding. Bro, Laura so, relates class to money. I relate class no, to the way people uh, act. But I just and the I way they are. Because I, thank you. So that's why I relate you to middle class. Well, to lower class, because, well, either way. Uh, <laughs> we're not going down that avenue. Uh, <laughs> Okay, so that illustrates some of Weber. So make sure that you know class consciousness, Marx's arguments, capitalism contains the seeds of its own destruction, Weber's class, status, and power, that you can have class, um, but not status, and that there are th these other dimensions. And next time we meet face-to-face, -face, I'll go over symbolic interaction before our Life Happens activity.